I think where the most important lenders are yeah. and part of the, the financing, obviously, of yeah. the transaction. But appraisers, especially in the luxury market or those that are, you know, kind of the, the unicorn on, on the block, I mean, they, they could tell you that you now have to bring 100K to the table or they could be the one that says now you get to get 800 grand cash out. Yeah. Just one individual person that is so subjective, supposedly, is literally going to tell you how much cash or how much cash you could get. Yeah. Well, now I know uh, next time in that situation, we can do up to six different appraisals. <laughs> so I want to touch on the the hard money loan products and what would make a good uh, project or borrower for that loan product. I know when I purchased the Scottsdale property, for example, um, you know, I knew I was going to do a full renovation. There was not going to be any income coming in uh, until we were done with that property. So I utilized a, a hard money loan product and we actually got, uh, I believe it was 80 percent loan to cost. Um, so the lender uh, basically funded 80% of the purchase price and 80% of all the uh, renovation costs. Um, and so that was quite nice. Um, so what are you guys seeing on your front in terms of the, the hard money rates these days? And um, what makes a good uh, borrower for that loan product? Yeah, so hard money, um, the, the most common I would say would be just a 12, 24 month loan, similar to probably what you did that, that length of time. Mm -hmm. But the, you know, client or, or the borrower is going to be able to put essentially 20% down. Right. But then the, the hard money lender is going to fund. Sometimes we're still doing it up to a hundred percent of the rehab. Right. Mm. So it's nice when you're doing a, a big rehab and you don't have to put three, 400 K or million bucks of your own money because you know that, Hey, in a year or two, I'm going to refi. The value is going to be, you know, 1.7 yeah. times more than I bought it and I'll be able to cash out and yep. you know make your profit obviously that way or you know sell it right mm -hmm. so the hard money I think in the investor world a hard money or the bridge rehab you know etc it's always going to be there there's always going to be a need for it now of course the rate's going to be a little bit higher because you know in your case I feel like the lender probably gave you a total loan amount that was higher than the purchase price right so the the risk on the lender side is a little bit higher, but yeah. you, as long as you're experienced now, we've seen a lot of clients that have gotten into bridges and, you know, a year ago, now they're coming to us like, I can't sell it. I can't get out of it. I don't mm -hmm. have it rented out. And, and those, you know, people that haven't done it before, you got to be careful. You got to run the numbers. You got to have somebody on your team that's maybe done it before. And you got to make sure that you're not just doing it because you saw a TikTok video saying, Hey, I bought this and turned it into a 300 K profit 12 months later. Right. right. So that's a very important thing we try to tell all of our clients that are that are doing it right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know on that property, I think I got eight or eight and a quarter interest only. Um, what are you guys seeing in terms of pricing today? I mean, right now we we were um, sizing up some some big ones like Hollywood Hill ones, yeah. and um, we were at a twelve month. I think with uh, with good amount of experience, I think it was nine nine nine. That's not bad. Twelve month yeah. interest only. I mean, that's that's pretty sweet for today's market because I think everyone just average wise, hard money is like 12, mm -hmm. 11, 12. But if you have the experience, you have the liquidity, 12 months, 999 kind of gets you a good chunk, right? And, yeah. and a lot of times you're, people are scared of the rate, but to go off the rate thing, it's higher, but you're not supposed to keep these loans for the full 12 months, right? Yeah. You're You're no. only keeping it for, let's say, six months or seven months, right? So... If you divide up the 10% or 12% by 12, right? Because you would have paid the full rate mm -hmm. at the end of the term. You're not, you know, paying the full 12% on, you know, when you're going to pay it off, yeah. right? And that's another important uh, takeaway for anyone out there looking to do some hard money loans is make sure that you understand how long your project is going to take and make sure that you have a little runway uh, should there be delays or should the timeline be extended because... You know, if you're doing a nine or 10 month project and you're just doing a 12 month term, no. that's not really yeah. giving yourself any margin for error. Because keep in mind, when you start the refinance process, it could very well take two to three months to get that refi done. Mm -hmm. So um, I always suggest, you know, if, you're, if you think it's going to take a year, get a two year note yeah. or make sure that there's an extension option baked in there, very even important. if you got to pay a little bit of premium for it. Yeah. Um, because some of those hard money lenders, and I'd love to ask you guys if you guys have ever, ever had any situations like this, but. Um, I know some of these hard money lenders will prey on like some new newbie investors that maybe get into some bad deals. Uh, they run out of money, they run out of time, and then they take back these assets at a discount. Have you guys ever seen any hard money uh, deals go bad where the lender has to, to basically uh, take the property back? I personally haven't seen any loan where the lender's taken the property back, but mm -hmm. I've seen pretty aggressive, almost predatory lending done where 
I've got a couple right now where we're trying to get a, a long-term refinance done for our clients. Mm -hmm. And um, the hard money lender, you know, expired like a month or two ago and they're charging a point or two points every month. Whoa. Every month. And, and, and that's, you know, when you're dealing with hard money, you're kind of doing a handshake deal with another person and yeah. there's no really recourse, right? Because yeah. the note that you signed was, hey, if I don't pay this back, I can take this property. So the lender can technically do whatever they want. And, and that's why, like you touched on, make sure you know the extension options. How yeah. much can, how much is going to cost me to extend? Make sure that if you think it's going to be a year, get a two year note. You don't want to yeah. mess with any sort of like, what's going to happen to my, you know, hard money loan? What's this lender going to do to me? Yeah. I think importantly too, like a third thing that we didn't really talk about, it helps to have a middle person. So like a broker, right? Or okay. like a loan person, like, you know, myself or Dustin, we do for our clients to have a middle person making sure that they're actually fighting for you, right? Even if it costs a little more, it's, hey, in, you know, sometimes if they're, you're in a predatory situation, right? Where you're a first time investor or something, you're going to someone hard money, hey, can you give me the terms? You don't know any better. You don't know what's out there. You don't know what's good. Um, to, so to have someone in the middle kind of negotiating for you a little bit, shopping for you, and then presenting to you the option that makes the most sense, even if it is a little more expensive up front, it'll save you in the long term because they'll, like for us, a lot of times when we do these deals, we do the hard money or, or private money, bridge loan, re rehab, and then we also paint, hey, this is the timeline. This is what it's going to look like afterwards, yeah. right? This is your exit. Yeah. So let's stay on track to get that exit done. Because the most important thing is to exit mm -hmm. once you enter into a, this short-term loan. So having someone in the middle also helps. Have you guys ever seen a, a borrower go from hard money to hard money because they yeah. needed more time and that lender's like, hey, I need my money back. Yeah. I can't give you an extension. Have you guys ever seen that happen before? Absolutely. I, I literally just did one last week. where did the guy, really? Yeah, he was, on a, he was on initially a 12-month. He got extended for 18. He was still doing it. And so we just got him another 12 month bridge with a, a completely different investor. Because the first lender is like, hey, I'm yeah. not, no more extensions. Yeah. Like he literally had sheriff show up at his house because the investor was trying to take the property. Whoa. I had to negotiate. And that's like what John was saying. Like when, when we're a broker, we obviously do more loans than our clients do right. in terms of, so we have, you know, the leverage, we've got some pool with the, with the investors that we're taking into. So a lot of times we can obviously negotiate and we've had prepayment penalties waived because we told the investor, Hey, we're going to, you know, take it here and, and give you some more loans on the back end. Right. So there's just a lot more that, that we can do in, in helping our clients, uh, you know, navigate that process. Are the prepayment penalties ever negotiable after you sign the loan docs? We've done it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 We've done it. Okay. It's got to be, on, yeah. like, you know, depending on the situation. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. Okay. Interesting, because um, I guess you don't get what you don't ask sometimes, and that's yeah. anything in life. Yep. But a lot of those loans are, are private loans, right? And yeah. then I guess anything's negotiable. That makes sense. Um, I wanted to do a little deep dive with you guys on kind of a personal deal that um, I'm going to be working on here soon. So um, selling a deal that I'm not going to touch on too much until it closes. Um, I can't speak on it too much for, for privacy reasons, but um, I'm going to be getting a, a pretty decent chunk coming my way. Um, here in about 60 to 75 days. And so I'm starting to like look at my options and I'm very bullish here in San Diego. We live in a great market. It has good fundamentals. I believe it's undervalued right now. If you just look at um, the rest of the big markets in California and you're seeing a lot of biotech companies uh, migrate in here. So, you know, the people that are actually migrating to California right now, they're coming in for high paying jobs. And so we're seeing a lot of growth um, and development here. So I'm very bullish in San Diego. And I also love the fact that, you know, you can buy a property on a big lot and you have potential to build ADUs and force some equity that way. And so I'm kind of looking at either getting a uh, SFR or a smaller multifamily property to where it's tired, but in a great location here in San Diego, close to the beach, uh, close to the five freeway, um, something that I can renovate. And then because it's on a big lot, I can start the permitting process to build additional units. Uh, the permitting process is typically going to take about 18 months. Um, I'm doing another one of um, these ADU projects right now in San Diego, and we've been waiting for permits for like 18 months now. So I don't care what the state says. Hey, you know, the city says, hey, we get these done. We're fast tracking them three to six months. It takes 18 months. Um, so that said, I really want to get into something to where I have capital to renovate, whether it's the main house or the, the, the units that are existing. I have the capital to renovate these now. I can cash flow it. It will have income coming in. We'll start the permitting process. And then 18 months down the road, when we actually get the permits to build the new construction, 
um, I have some more capital on that back end. So it's going to be a little bit longer timeline. And then once it's all complete, you know, it's probably going to be two, two and a half years, then refinance into some perm debt. What do you guys suggest there in terms of the best lending options? I mean, up front, I'd say if it's going to be 18 months and you want to give yourself time, I, I probably wouldn't buy it on bridge debt. Yeah. I'd probably do it on maybe like a, like a DSCR or a, um, like a stated income or bank statement income yeah. buy it kind of non QM, um, with maybe like a one year prepay, even if it costs a little more. Okay. Um, just so that you don't, you're not stressing yourself out if it's a two or three year note, even mm -hmm. if it, if things aren't going your way, right. Cause you can always refi out of it, um, and cash out or do whatever if, if it continues to go up and you build your, your items. Um, and then sometimes, I mean, we've done it very often. You have the long-term debt in place. You could potentially pay that off and do a bridge when you're ready to like actually build stuff mm. to finance the rehab and do like a 12 or 18 month loan or 24 month loan after you get the permits, right? Then, because then you actually have a bridge going in place where you're not stressing like, hey, I'm I'm gonna be screwing myself every month until something happens, and I'm stressing because of the timeline. You have a long term fixed debt, so you're not worried. And then afterwards, you can refi into a bridge. Mm -hmm. And then kind of go the backwards way and then mm -hmm. do that, finance the rehab, finance whatever you need to do, build whatever you want, and then refi out of it using the new ARV. Yeah. Right. So it's like, it's a three-step process, takes a little longer, but it's the least stressful way to do it. Just because someone like yeah. yourself, you have a lot going on, yeah. right? You have a lot of projects going on and you, you know, having the stress of like, oh, I'm, it's going to expire in like three months. I got to find something in two months. I got to find something in one month. It's yeah. like. It's, it's, it's a lot, right? So the only caveat with that, and I, I like that option mm -hmm. is that if I'm going to be 1031 in these proceeds mm -hmm. and I get into just a fixed rate mortgage and I, I, I hold back the rest of my 1031 proceeds to do renovations, I don't know how that's going to be, uh, looked at from a tax perspective. So if I do, mm -hmm. if I do need to roll all the 1031 proceeds into the deal and do a bridge, is there another option for that? Technically, 1031, um, it, to my knowledge, you have yeah. to use it for the acquisition. Okay. Um, it's not really like cash you can pull out because once you pull out cash from the 1031, that's mm. actually capital gains. Mm. So um, to my understanding, you have to kind of put it into the property, into okay. the purchase because it's always like, kind, or greater. Um, so I think if it's coming from a 1031 perspective, you would move everything anyways to whatever or find multiple to buy to kind of spread that money around. Um, because just because the 1031, I think, again, CPAs can correct me if I'm wrong, yeah, but of you have to, you have to actually put it towards the property and you can't pull it out before it becomes capital gains. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to talk to a CPA about, about all that. Um, I am curious, um, because if I do some sort of bridge loan, like, like if I do a three-year bridge loan, mm -hmm. I'm going to be paying pretty expensive money, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay. So if it's three years of paying 12% versus just getting into something for seven yeah. or six and a half. Yeah. That makes a lot of or sense. Or like do, do what we were talking about earlier, like a five-year fixed, mm -hmm. you know, with interest only. Yeah. And then that way you have the five-year period, refi out in two, three years when you start doing the bridge product to get the funding. Um, and then, you know, refi again after with the new ARV, mm -hmm. right? So I think that's, it's a multi-step, but it's the safest way to, to go when the least probably the least expensive it's going to end up being the least expensive just because a two or like the longer the bridge loan is the more expensive it is right yeah. you know this too so yeah. if it's a two-year note two years is more expensive than one year three years obviously more expensive than two year and the one year so um it's just extra stress that i don't think is needed up sure. front yeah okay and i was thinking you could also just get you know get an acquisition on a on a 30-year fixed dscr like you know what, what what john's done for you in the past and you can get a second trustee. You can get a second oh, yeah. mortgage and use that for the cash or, or use that for already, pardon me, for the, uh, the rehab. Um, those are getting pretty common right now. I know John's doing a couple, um, you know, the, the rates are a little bit higher, but at least that way you can get something that's essentially on the acquisition fixed for 30 years. You don't have a time frame, And even the second trustees, some yeah. of those are 10 or 30 years as well. Right. So that's a good point. And then the second, the second will be a higher rate, but it's a smaller loan amount. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so you're only paying the higher rate for a smaller portion. That makes sense. Um, I'm going to throw another one out for you guys then. Uh, what if I decide, hey, I'm going to go purchase a piece of land and go through the permitting process and do a, a ground up development deal. 
Um, what kind of lending would you recommend for something like that? Learning to become a successful real estate investor can take a lot of time and dedication, which some people just don't have. If you're one of these individuals, this doesn't mean you can't invest in real estate. My company, Summers Capital, is buying a bunch of boutique hotels right now, and you can invest with us in these deals without having to do any of the work. Our team sources the deals, we secure the lending, we take care of all the renovations, and we even handle all the day-to-day -day operations with our in-house management company, making it truly hands-off and passive for our investors. If you want to learn more to see if we can help you, go to summerscapital.com slash invest to book a call with our team. Again, that's summerscapital.com slash invest. Now back to the show. How th those you've got to just do your typical kind of construction loan, you know, 12, 24, sometimes they'll go up to, you know, 48. We haven't seen too many five-year construction yeah. deals, but, you know, the leverage that you get on land is always going to be a lot less than the leverage you would get on something that's already there that you're essentially just tearing down and building straight up. Um, but we do, we're doing those probably same, depending where you take it and how much documentation you're going to provide, yeah. you could see them anywhere from eight to 12%. Okay. Yeah. And what kind of leverage can you get on a piece of land? 60, 65. If you're lucky, most yeah. are at 50 right now. Okay. Yeah. But if you come in with plans, mm -hmm. like plans already approved and whatever to purchase and then build, sometimes lenders will kind of based on the future asset give you a little more leverage. But even then, I think the max I've ever seen it is 70. So okay. it's still a lot more in upfront. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So if you were to purchase, you know, this piece of land, okay. and then let's say it takes three years to get the permits to start building, then you would take on another loan at that, at that point. Yeah. And there's lenders out there that will just finance the construction on a short-term basis. Well, it it would refi whatever the acquisition was on the on oh they would the purchase they would of take the land. the land as well yeah and, be, and hold that in first lien position correct because it, well they would refi and be one loan so yeah. the land would be refied out that you purchased the land with whatever okay. you did and then it would be that loan plus the construction budget or whatever you're trying to finance put together into one loan mm. and they would just do that as a three year or four year whatever the term is that you need yeah um and do a loan based on that. What kind of collateral does a lender have uh, in second lien position? Because I, you know, obviously in first lien position, you can take the property back at any time, which is great collateral. But if you're a lender in second lien position and you already have another lender uh, in first lien, what kind of rights do you have in second lien position should that borrower default? Well, just like it's not, you're in second position, you're second in line. So until that first person or the person in first uh, lien position gets paid, you know, you're not going to get paid your full amount. Now, obviously, because of the fact that you're in second position, that's why yeah. you're paying a, a much higher rate. Right. Okay. So basically, you don't have a lot of leverage or a position in that in that second lien position. Yeah. Especially if it's a tight deal with not as much uh, equity. Yeah. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to run another, another by you. Um, so, you know, obviously right now, short-term rentals are a hot topic. Um, mm -hmm. People are buying a lot of short-term rentals all over the country. Um, right now, I know, I know before the rates went up, you guys could do DSCR products, non QM for as little as 10 to 15% down for a short term rental. Um, what is someone going to put down now if they wanted to go buy a, let's say a half a million dollar single family home and they want to operate it as a short term rental? What kind of terms and pricings are they, are they looking at? So you're looking, I mean, short term rentals, you're normally going to see a 5% haircut. That's okay. just kind of the standard right now in yeah. terms of the leverage. So probably putting 25% down and we've got um, a pr pretty unique fund that we're using right now specifically for short-term rentals where pretty much everybody else is going to require that you have experience doing short-term rentals, that you have, you know, a 12-month history of collecting short-term rental income or the previous owner, if you're buying it, had it as a short-term rental. Mm. Um, now what we're doing is strictly using air DNA data okay. and we'll take essentially 90% of whatever the air DNA data says, and we'll run the deck service coverage based only off of the air DNA, no previous history, no lease, none of that. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. And so you're, you're saying 20 to 25% down. Most likely 25, 25 for short term. Okay. Yeah. And then what kind of rates are you seeing for that product? We probably get it right now. I think it was like seven, eight we were talking about yeah. earlier, right? Seven, 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 eight. Yeah. With a prepayment penalty? Normally, those, the lowest rate's going to be if you take a five year, okay. but you could probably get down to a, a no prepay. It'll go up to maybe eight and a half. Yeah. Okay. I got another one for you guys. Um, so I bought this property in 2020, right when the pandemic started. Uh, it was like April or May of uh, the pandemic in 2020. 
And uh, I picked it up on a Navy Federal Credit Union, 0% down, 100% finance loan. Um, and I technically lived on the property for a little bit. I had every intention to live there as a primary residence. Um, but I have been operating it as a short-term rental um, because my plans changed. And um, it's a single family house. It's a three bedroom, two bath house here in San Diego. And in the back, it had a brand new ADU. And uh, the sellers were actually, they had just completed this ADU in the back. They had furnished the property. They were actually uh, going to operate it as an Airbnb. They actually had like bookings uh, on their calendar, but they hadn't started yet. And then the pandemic dropped, they got scared and they, they listed it. And I went and picked this thing up. It was already furnished. I got it for zero down. And then I negotiated the seller to cover all the closing costs. So I'm operating this whole thing as a short-term rental. And um, it's been operating very, very well um, ever since I've had it. But I put in the plans for the city to get permits to build out a third unit. The lot is actually zoned for four units, but we're not going to put four on there. I'm just going to do an additional uh, one bedroom, one bath, which we're going to be building out starting in March. It'll probably take about eight weeks. Um, but after that is done, the value of the property is going to be worth a lot more than, than what I bought it for. So um, my question to you guys is what is going to be a good loan product for this property? It's going to be three units. Um, I think the ARV is going to be around 1.6 or so. Um, what is a good product there? And it is operating. We can show three, three and a half years of short-term rental income. Um, what do you guys suggest there? I mean, on that one, then, if since you have history and you you yourself are experienced with short term rental, I think product wise, you know, we can. I mean, we might be able to get you lower than what we just talked about, mm -hmm. just because um, we're still working out the kinks with the fund that ha gives us a thirty year fixed at like six five six sure. three. Um, but we're starting to like work with them a little bit, rewrite the underwriting guidelines to allow for short term rentals to happen. If that case is the case, maybe a 5% haircut, 70% cash out, maybe 65% cash out, whatever it is, um, might be able to still get you leveraged there at the lower rates. Or we can do what Dustin was talking about up to 75% on the cash out, because I'm assuming you want the cash out mm -hmm. um, at the you know seven range that we were talking about. Got it. Um, and you can still have, I mean, technically you have no money in. But, you know, it's just free extra cash for you. To put to work. To put to work. Exactly. So. I would probably do that. Um, I wouldn't go normal DSC. Obviously, long-term rents don't work on that property. Yeah. But short-term rents, AirDNA, like all that stuff is very, it, it's indicative of you being able to pull out as much as possible. So something like what we just talked about. Yeah. So since we manage that property in-house mm -hmm. with uh, Fortune Cribs, would it make sense to do a long-term lease agreement with Fortune Cribs at an X amount rate? And then in terms of the refi for that particular property, now we're not showing short-term rental income. We're showing, hey, we got a long-term lease agreement in TAC um, for three years or whatever it is. Would that actually get me a lower rate? Yeah, we're, I'm doing, you keep bringing up examples that we're actually doing right now. Um, I've got a one in, um, it's in Encinitas actually. Really? Yeah. Love that market. Um, client bought it for like one eight, nine months ago, rehabbed it. Now it's worth three mil. Um, but he's going to short-term rent it out. But I told him, look, Go get a management company that will manage it for you. Mm -hmm. Sign a long-term lease. Just make sure it's longer than 12 months. Pardon me, 12 months or longer. Yeah. Then we can use that. And that way you can get basically into our fund that's at, you know, six and a half percent on a 30-year fix. Mm. Okay. But the only thing that is a little tricky is um, when the appraiser comes out, making sure that the market rents and the current rents like kind of match a yeah. little bit um, because- we have lenders that'll take just lease agreements or just the market rents without taking lease agreements. Sure. But um, if you kind of, it becomes tricky because if you have it be too high and it's not believable, then the lender is always going to be conservative, right? Mm -hmm. So it has to be within reason. And then, you know, appraiser has to agree with what you're, you're putting as the rents, the long-term rents too. Yeah. yeah. So if the, the lessee is, does a, a long-term lease agreement and they're just like, hey, this is, you know, we're going to operate this as corporate rentals or whatever. Um, and it is kind of the truth, right? We're operating in the short-term stays, um, you know, and we're willing to pay a premium because of the convenience factor. Uh, you think appraisers would balk at that? I think appraisers right now, it's kind of weird because even though rates are kind of coming down like we talked about, um, they're not like all the way down. Yeah. Appraisers are starting to get a little antsy about the market in general mm. i'm seeing uh, rents come in lower i'm like rental comps come in lower i'm seeing um, appraisals come in lower i'm seeing declining market 
boxes being checked by the appraisers. So I think right if you were to tell me right now, yeah, they would probably be a little wary about of uh, of giving you higher rents. Yeah. Um, just because I'm even seeing it in different markets, you know, Arizona, uh, Florida, Texas, California, where rents are just they're coming in like a thousand that twelve hundred bucks lower than what you know we initially anticipated even if we have signed lease agreements yeah so appraisers are trying to cover their butts i think with the market where it is yeah so yeah it would be hard right now but in a different market like ask me last year i would have said all day long yeah you know yeah yeah i'm lucky that um we refinanced out the scottsdale property yeah. when we did um so that's interesting what you've mentioned about the appraisals coming in low are you seeing that across a lot of markets right now. And what is that box that you alluded to? You said it's a declining market box. What is that? Yeah. So um, on the appraisal, it's kind of easy to miss, mm. but there's always a market report okay. um, within the county, within the city, uh, within the state. You know, there's a little check boxes. Is it, is it declining or is it stable? There's two choices. Um, and I'm seeing appraisers start to mark off declining market, which means that they're seeing home prices because they're always sales comparables. They're seeing home prices start to fall in the certain market or radius that they're looking at. Um, the reason that's important is because lenders actually look at that, underwriters look at that box. Because if that box is checked, then they will actually decrease the amount of leverage they're gonna give you by five to 10%, sometimes even 15%. Mm. So if you were gonna, like on a purchase, if you were gonna buy something you were putting 25 down, so it's gonna be 75% loan to value, if the appraiser checks declining market, right, it could realistically, drop your leverage down to 70 or 65%. So now you were planning to only bring 25, you have to bring 30 or 35, right? Sure. So that's happening, uh, it's pockets that it's happening in, but it's happening in pockets that I did not expect mm -hmm. would happen. Yeah. And at that time, uh, if that appraisal doesn't come back where you want it, is it necessarily difficult to swap out and, and get another appraiser? I mean, it, the other another example. example. <laughs> Literally this morning, I've got a client in Florida. Um, it's a refi, so it doesn't have that kind of deadline like a purchase would be where it's kind of hard just to like swap out an appraisal because you've got to meet the close of escrow, right? Sure. Um, but this was a 4.5 million appraisal value that we finally got, but it took us six times. Mm. So fortunately with us, when you work with Convoy. Six times. Six times. <laughs> six different appraisers came out. So six different appraisers came out. <laughs> wow. Okay. So I, we, I let them know, hey, up front, look, if we don't get the value we want, I'm not going to show it to the lender. I'm not going to show it to the underwriter. We'll, we'll toss it. We fought every single one. Not one was successful. We tried to rebuttal it, show different comps, show the leases that he already, like, didn't work at all. But essentially, when you get a loan that's over, what, one and a half or two million, depending on the lender, you have to get two appraisals. Yeah. And they're always going to take the lower of the two. So we had the first one came in great. We were all stoked. The next four just low, 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 low. And then finally, literally this morning, we got one at four and a half where we started. And then we're probably going to closing next week. And this is a refi or a sale? A refi. Refi. Yeah. Because he you needed can't that. do that on a sale. Yeah. yeah. No so way. he needed that specific valuation so he could pay off the other notes? Is Not that to what pay. It was? He wanted a, a decent amount of cash. Cash out. He bought it for, I want to say, literally two years ago mm. for like 800 grand. Wow. And he built it all himself put all of his own money into the rehab. So that's why he's trying to get as much as yeah. you know, possible. He just happened to refi at six months too late. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> that's crazy. But from 800 grand to four and a half, what did he do to the property? He put in like two, I mean, it was like a two bed, one bath, nothing crazy um, at the time. And then he turned it into like a, a luxury five bed, five bath, huge back house, huge pool, you know, right near the water in, in, um, in, uh, in Palm Beach. Palm Beach. Is yeah. that Florida? Yeah. Okay. Love that. I remember when we were refinancing out my, my Scottsdale property, we had to get two appraisals. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember flying out to Scottsdale and I stacked both of those appraisers back to back. I think it was like a Monday morning. I flew out and, um, you know, walking both of them through the, the property. Um, they were both super cool. And I remember one of them, uh, he was from, uh, I think he was from Romania, but super cool guy. And I was kind of walking him through. We were playing a little beach volleyball. We were playing little hoops even played a game of ping pong. I was like, dude, this guy's going to give me a great appraisal. <laughs> and so uh, the other guy, that guy gave us the appraisal right away and it came in at like 4.89. Yeah. We're like, holy cow. Because yeah. we were like thinking 3.5, maybe 3.7. Mm -hmm. And the first one comes at, at 4.89. And the appraiser calls me, that guy that wrote us at 4.89. He's like, hey man, I got you at 4.89. Let me know what the other one comes back at. 
And I said, cool, I got you. And so I texted the other appraiser, and this is the one that I was playing yeah. volleyball with and ping pong. I was like, this is my guy. I was like, hey man, uh, the first appraiser appraisal came in at 4.89, uh, just FYI. Never hear anything back, no text back. And like three hours later, Jonathan calls me. He's like, dude, uh, they turned you in for influencing the, the valuation yeah. of the property. Yeah. What the hell does that mean? Is that, have you guys seen that before? Uh, you know what? Your, your appraisal was probably, I mean, we've seen it before, before, but I've never seen it in the scale that that appraiser took it. Yeah. Um, you, that appraiser took it to the next level. They reported to the AMC, the appraisal management company, and then also, you know, somehow reported it to the lender as well. Cause I wasn't going to turn in any appraisal, you know, like Dustin said, that yeah. doesn't come in good, Yeah. but it's, it was just, it was the most obs obscure situation I've ever seen an appraiser take it, but he took it to all the lengths, reported you, said you were trying to influence the valuation, which means that, hey, you're trying to up the value. You're value fishing is yeah. essentially what they, yeah. what they call it. And um, because they thought you were value fishing, they were like, you know, Rich is selling me too hard on the 4.89. <laughs> I'm about to be sold. I, I don't want to do the appraisal because it's yeah. technically supposed to be non-biased. Sure. So um, they declined it, reported it, you know, went the whole hundred yard yeah. dash of what they need to do to report something. And then it was, we had to backtrack and then order a separate different appraiser yeah. entirely. So I was like, Jonathan, what yeah. does this mean? Am I, am I going to get in trouble? He's <laughs> yeah. like, no, nah, you're good. Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're good. I mean, yeah. you know, we took, there was a, like Dustin knows when that happened, my, I was running around like my hair was on fire because, <laughs> you know, technically it is kind of a big deal on our yeah. side. Um, cause it's then the AMCs and the appraisal management companies, if it's reported, sometimes they see that on the, on the, um, they see your name highlighted and the address and then appraisers don't want to pick it up. Mm. So that's what I was worried about, like getting, if it was flagged to the point where nobody wanted to pick up the order, then we yeah. can't do the loan. Yeah. So we were just running around going crazy. And then luckily the appraisal management company that we had, the, we do a lot of business with them. So the president was like, hey, let me step in, let me help out. And then massaged it out a little bit and we were able to successfully order another one. Yeah. yeah. And so then uh, the third appraiser rolls in and I'm like, at this point, I'm yeah. like, I'm not going to fly out to the property yeah, 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 um, yeah. to meet him. I'm like, we don't need to play ping pong for this one. So, <laughs> uh, so I, I just, I shot him an email Yeah, and I, I, I remember asking you, I'm like, Hey man, like, I'm just going to shoot him an email with the first appraisal and I'm going to just attach it and just say, Hey, uh, I attached some information that might make your assessment a little bit easier. Let me know if you have any questions yeah. and, uh, sent that over to him. And, uh, that was it. There was no ping pong. There was no volleyball. <laughs> And that, that second uh, or that third appraisal came in where we needed it and we yeah. got the deal done. So yeah. it's just, it's so subjective though. It is. It is. It's, I mean, that's how it works. Yeah. It's un, to our demise actually, because we, we stress out a lot about that stuff, yeah. but it's, you know, it's just how it is. It's just because too much influence, oh wait, few bad apples ruined it for everybody. Yeah. So now anything that seems remotely influential or same thing with us, like we can't steer people like anti-steering laws we can't steer people towards predatory loans like that's not yeah. legal you know and, and which so, is a good thing overall yeah. but like i feel like if you're refinancing a six hundred thousand dollar single family home mm -hmm. where there's comps everywhere within a three mile radius um the value is going to come in in a, in a relatively small window mm -hmm. but if you're refinancing a, a luxury home at a four to five million dollar valuation um and there's not a lot of comps within a few mile radius you might have one appraisal that comes back at 4.9 and another one that comes back at 3.9. Yeah. Um, it's just a big window when you started getting into those, those lo higher uh, loan amounts. Yeah. Hey guys, real quick, I hope that you're finding value in this show. If you could do me a huge favor and drop a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or whichever platform you're listening on, it would mean the world to me. Also, if you know of anyone that would potentially benefit from this podcast, feel free to share it with them so we can help more people build wealth through real estate investing. Now back to the show. No, that's something, I don't know how or, or when, you know, that issue is going to be fixed because you can yeah. arguably say, I, I think we're the most important lenders are yeah. <laughs> and part of the, the financing, obviously, of yeah. the transaction, but appraisers, especially in the luxury market or those that are, you know, kind of the, the unicorn on, on the block. I mean, they, they could tell you that you now have to bring a hundred K to the table, or they could be the one that says, now you get to get 800 grand cash out. Yeah. Just one individual person that is so subjective, supposedly is literally going to tell you how much cash or how much cash you could get. Yeah. Well, now I know uh, next time in that situation, we can do up to six different appraisals. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can go as many as you want. How long was that process? Uh, oh, I think it's like since mid-November. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, we had to wait for the one to come in 
normally 10 days right now, probably from the time you order till you actually get the report. So we had to wait, you know, 10 days for five, six times to see if it was going to work. But, yeah. you know, fortunately, you know, he, he did the same thing that you did on like the second one mm -hmm. where he, we actually had, it's, um, it's a, it's called an heirs report. It's an yeah. appraisal investigation essentially. And it was on hold for like a month or whatnot. And then, you know, we kind of let the, uh, the AMC know that, Hey, he wasn't, you know, trying to, in terms influence anything. He was just upset that he got one appraisal at four or five and the second guy came back at 2.4. Mm. And that's really what kind of set him off. And I told him, look, We'll keep finding new appraisers until 2. we get to 2.4 from the 4.5. 2.4. Holy cow. That was the second spread. one. That's, yeah, we that's were, a huge I, spread. I was livid. <laughs> I was livid because I thought we were about to close because we were waiting on that yeah. second appraisal. And then it was like, all right, well, we're going to go down this until we get what you need. Yeah, yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, what are you guys seeing as we kind of look out into the horizon here? Um, real estate forecasts. What are you guys seeing? Because obviously... You know, I'm not seeing a lot of inventory, uh, especially in the markets that I'm looking in, especially here in San Diego. Um, we're just not seeing uh, many sellers that want to sell their properties at this point. Um, you know, if, if you have 3% debt on a property and you don't need the cash, why would you sell or refinance right now? So um, we're seeing low inventory. We're not seeing a lot of transactions happen. Um, in order for values to start really declining, we need to see a big wave of owners that want to sell their properties at a discount. Um, what are you guys forecasting as we move forward um, in the next 12 months? I think, um, I think valuations will, will still remain pretty strong in, mar in pockets, right? Mm -hmm. So we're talking pockets of LA, San Diego, like the, the big areas where people want to be and mm -hmm. the valuations are high and they've been high the last two years. Um, they're gonna, I think they're going to remain pretty much the same. Um, maybe tick down slightly, but not sharply. Um, but for other markets, like for example, Idaho, we were just talking to one of our clients there and the market got hit really hard in Boise the last six months, seven really? months. Yeah, they they had a major decline. Because they've been on Boise's been on a tear Correct. over the last yeah. six years. But they were on a major decline. Mm. So properties were 20, 30, 40 percent discount in some cases. And now they're actually starting to see it stabilize out. So pockets of the country are going to hit, like they're going to have hard hits, but I think the majority of everything, like you said, inventory is still low. It's more expensive to someone, for someone to buy a new house and move in than to keep their current house. Yeah. So I think inventory will kind of remain low. And if inventory remains low, I said this on um, Ryan Pineda's podcast as well when we went on, the only way a huge economic crash happens in the real estate side is if people sell. Mm -hmm. Right. Like you just said, at right. a discount. So if nobody's selling on a discount, it's very difficult to have a crash happen. Um, yeah. So I think it'll remain. I think um, uh, maybe pockets will decline and people are going to look at those pockets. And be like, Look, the whole world's falling mm -hmm. apart because now the, it's declining 20 percent. And but if you look at the actual individual markets, right, mm -hmm. which is how you actually have to compare it. Most of the markets are going to be OK, yeah. I think. And yeah. I think it'll remain that way. It's just, you know. Because yeah. if you're a homeowner right now, and let's say uh, you want to sell, well, what are you going to do? You're going to you're going to get out of your three percent mortgage. Mm -hmm. You're not going to go buy something at seven percent. Um, you're going to go rent. But right now, in a lot of these strong markets, rents are are very expensive. Yep. I know here in San Diego, there's been like thirteen and a half percent rent growth over the last twelve months, yeah. just because of all the inflation and and all the the net migration in. Um, so I just feel like as a homeowner now, your best option is to just sit on it. And just wait and see. Um, at least for me right now, I'm like, I, I don't, I wouldn't sell a home that I lived in in San Diego right this second unless I was like moving because of my family or I'm getting uprooted because of my job or something like that. What are your thoughts, Dustin? No, I mean, it, you, you hit it right on the head again. Like if you've got a 3% mortgage and, and you're planning to either move or upgrade most of the times when you move, you're going to probably upgrade, sure. right? But you're, you're now talking about a mortgage payment that's not only going to double, especially if you upgrade, it might triple. Mm -hmm. Right. So for people to comfortably say, you know, I, I'm in a two million dollar home right now and it's where or it's at a three percent. You go buy a two and a half million dollar home and you're getting at six and a half. Well, now all of a sudden your living expenses just nearly tripled. Right. And that's why it's so hard for um, sellers or for buyers trying to buy properties because you're not going to get anything unless you find a seller that actually has to sell, not not a seller that just wants to sell. And that's why we're seeing such a low amount of you know, transactions, especially in the luxury market, like th those have 
declined so much more significantly than, you know, kind of your median average home prices, right? Because the, the increase on the, the monthly payment when you're talking about a, a luxury, you know, property, yeah. that, that's, that's not, a, you know, a small amount. Yeah, it's a big delta. And you know, the market's kind of changing. It's funny, but you know, the market's changing when the, um, the luxury real estate agents are calling us asking if we have clients. You know, mm. like asking, hey, you know, this is we can get a discount of a mill, we can get a discount of, of two mil, whatever it is. When when us loan people are starting to get calls from agents, I think that that's when it, you know, especially in the luxury space, it's like, wow, the, the pool of buyers is very, very small. What are you guys seeing on your end in terms of uh, like transactions with these other brokerages? Because I know I know you guys are are hustlers and you guys are on the up and up and you guys are growing your your. Um your business portfolio, but like, what are you guys seeing with some of these other companies that we just, we alluded to Sprout closing their doors. Are you guys seeing a lot of these, these newer lenders and loan officers kind of pivot out of the industry? What are you guys seeing? I think we're seeing, well, obviously the conventional side has, has been hit the hardest. Yeah. You know, non kim's actually upticked a bit in terms of the fact that we can now do loans that conventional, you know, underwritten loans that clients used to try and go can now do. Right. So in terms of like transactions wise, we're, we're, Convoy itself, we're, we can do business pretty much in all 50 states. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we've really been focusing on mainly, what do you say, 90% of our business is investment properties. Yeah. And those right now, because of our, you know, book of business and, and clients, all investors right now, th they're loving this market because they're now competing against 70, 80% less than they were a year ago, right? A year ago, everybody could buy something. Yeah. The rates were so low. Yeah. But now it really takes an experienced investor that will run the numbers, We'll get the cash flow, you know, to where it may be. They're not so rate sensitive, right? As long as the, the property can cash flow, an investor doesn't necessarily care as much as somebody that's buying it as an owner occupied residence where, well, now that rate matters a lot because the only way I'm paying that is for my job, right? Yeah. So in terms of transaction wise, it's, it's no secret that, it, that it's across the board went down, right? Yeah. Um, fortunately for us, we're, we're still probably operating Compared to at the the boom, we'll say at the beginning of 2022, mm -hmm. I think we're probably down 10 percent. Yeah, not transaction much. wise. So you know, we're, we're that's you guys. That's, that's you guys, us. not the industry as a no, whole. No, yeah. the industry as a whole is is struggling a lot. Yeah. We we get um, we are starting to get approached more on hey, can we just can we join hands? Can we join your shop? Can mm. we 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 want to you know they're they're starting to really shrink out there because the market share if you don't know how to navigate and you weren't prepared for this market um you know some brokerages are laying off 95 percent of their staff it's just becoming a one percent one man two man shop yeah you know it, it's that's just the way it is you just can't afford to keep overhead and you just can't afford to do loans um but that's the market we're in so yeah. majority of brokerages right now are down heavy um, but you know, it, we'll see it. I think it'll get worse, a little worse. And I th we'll see a lot of people that were in for the boom and just in for the boom continue to exit. And especially like older, um, loan people that we're seeing actually, like people that have been in the game for 30 plus years, mm -hmm. like this is their, this is their bowing out now. Really? Yeah. I'm seeing a lot of people bow, actually just bow out and say, I can't make, I can't fight and I don't have the willpower yeah. to fight through another you know, recession or period where sure. you really need to grind. This is where I, I'm, I made enough money. This is where I bow. Yeah. And yeah. so for people like you guys, myself included, I'm mm -hmm. like, dude, this is where the opportunity exactly. is at. This is where you make your money. Yeah. Cause you know, if, if you can figure it out, if you can figure out a way to, to make it now, uh, when things do improve and they will improve, you're going to be making a killing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, guys, it's been real. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. It's, uh, it's been an honor to uh, have you guys on the show. Thank you so much no, for having thank us. thank you. Yeah. yeah. Listeners, go uh, shoot these guys a follow on social. If you guys want to get loans done, hit these guys up. We'll uh, tag their uh, info, contact info in the show notes. Thank you for tuning in and peace. Peace.